Howdy everyone, welcome to another episode of Matthew Answers the Internet, where I search the internet for burning board game questions, and then do my best shot at answering them here for you. And the first question I have for you this month is how do you feel comfortable buying a game on Kickstarter if you haven't played it? Seems like a gamble. Kickstarter is a lot less like a shop front or a storefront going to a board game shop and buying a game and much more like investing in an idea, investing in a product. That's certainly how Kickstarter will phrase it as well. And yes, we know there are those out there that use Kickstarter, in, not just in board games, but in the whole world, that use Kickstarter as a pre-order service or a shop front. But that's not really what it's meant for. It's meant to help invest in an idea. So it's always going to be a gamble on Kickstarter. I mean, something crazy could happen. The world could have a pandemic and there could be a global shipping crisis and no one can get any cardboard. Who knows? Things happen. But if I do, the few things that I will always try to do is have a look to see if it's a company that we, as a, as a board gaming hobby, believe is a reputable company. Obviously, if you're going with a company who is their first game, that's more of a gamble. And maybe it's an investment in that company, in that idea, and that's a good thing to do. But also, if it's a bigger company that uses Kickstarter a lot, they've got a track record. And board gamers are very vocal about what that track record is. Try and peruse a lot of this because it can be very biased one way or the other. So you have to do a, a lot of reading on a board game geek forum to get like a a real level of what's true or not. But even then, that might not help. And my golden rule for Kickstarter is I wouldn't back any game that did not have a copy of the rules PDF available for you to read through. It doesn't have to be the finished rules. It doesn't have to be, you know, glossy with all this, everything. But I need the rules to be available so I can see if there's a game there. It's like needing to see the blueprints of a building before anyone lays the first stone. I need to know we have a plan. I need to know there's a, a map of where we're going with this game. But now it really is becoming more and more of the status quo to put your game on tabletop simulator, tabletopia, so people can play the bloody game before they back it. And that's amazing and something that's really something that I would urge people to do before they back a game. And before we go on to the next question, I'm gonna go stand over there and tell you all about the sponsor for this month's episode. This episode is sponsored in part by the upcoming Aircon 2022 board game convention next March, which, full disclosure, is happening in partnership with Watch It Played. Tickets for Aircon 2022 have now gone on sale. I've been to almost all of them, but the whole team from Watch It Played is planning on being there too. And we'd love to meet and play games with you. We're incredibly excited about Aircon which will be the first convention that many of us have attended in two years. I mean, the last time I saw Paul was at Aircon 2019. I barely even remember what she sounds like. I'm Paula. I'm bad at rolling dice, uh, chicken sandwiches. That's me. Additionally, Aircon has announced a pre-convention mini tour called Airbus. And before the convention begins, you can travel up from London with us to the event in Harrogate with some adventures scheduled along the way. This is the nicest bus I've ever seen. Plus it has tables for gaming. Airbus tickets are now on sale, but there's a very limited number of seats available. So for convention ticket information, hotel information, bus tour information, and the best board game bring and buy sell this side of the Yorkshire Dales, follow the link in the video's description. And we're really excited for Aircon 2022, and we hope we see you there. The next question I have for you is, long flight coming up, what are the best roll and write games small enough to fit on an airplane tray table? If I have one ability in life, it's the secret power to be able to knock myself unconscious while traveling. It's pretty good. I can't sleep at night, but if I'm on a plane, I'm dead to the world. But a darn good way to pass the time while you fly is going to be a roll and write game. Now, I've got lots of suggestions which I'm going to read out from here. Firstly, I don't think you want a roll and write game. I think you want a flip and fill, which is like a roll and write, innit? But you're flipping the car instead of rolling a dice. Two reasons. Less noise for people around you. Second reason. It's cards and not dice that are going to go everywhere on a plane. 
So the first four suggestions are fantastic flipping field games, and that's Cartographers, amazing game. Welcome To, which probably has a bigger footprint, but a really, really brilliant game. Kokoro, which used to be called Avenue, that's a kind of like line-making, path-building flipping field game, which is really fun. And Silver and Gold, which is by Phil Walker Harding, which is all about maps and stuff, and that's really, really fun. But if you're desperate to play a roll and write to get the thrill of the dice, I would always suggest Harvest Dice. Brilliant game, underrated. Roll for the Ages, classic roll and write fun. Dice Charmers, which is the Rajas of the Ganges uh, dice game, which is a lot of fun for combo stuff. Biblios Quill and Parchment, which is a lot like Biblios the card game. It really does feel like Biblios the card game but as a roll and write. And Fiverr Finden, which is a Haber game about p finding patterns. Now I know I'm going to regret this when I have to edit this and put all these graphics in, but I've got a bunch of suggestions for games you can play in a plane. Hive, fantastic little abstract strategy game. You can get a pocket version, which is even smaller. That's a good one. Picomino is a real classic push your luck game, which is kind of like a roll and write because you're pushing your luck and Yahtzee rolling dice to get worms. Board games. If Ryan and Knitz, your push your luck games are the thing you like, then I would always suggest Age of War, which is a, one of my favourite push your luck games of all time. Two abstract strategy games that I think would also work are TAC, because you can get a travel edition, and a game called Sword and Strongholds, which is this game right here, which is a, a wonderful, completely underrated abstract strategy game. Also, you could probably play like an exit or an unlock game on a plane. That would be a really cool thing to do I think. But I know for a fact that where there's a will there's a people playing viticulture on an airplane. There's two of my best friends Nick and Mike playing viticulture on an airplane. I don't know if they use the Tuscany expansion. I didn't think to ask. Question three this episode is how long is too long to allow a retcon in a game? With retcons, I really feel as though if it's something that doesn't change the game, other than giving someone the resources they need, it doesn't change the information that's been gained in the game, then I kind of feel like it's all right. It is frustrating when somebody is continually doing it, where they're not paying attention when they're playing a game, and then they keep on asking to be able to do things out of turn because they're not playing the game with a with a full mind. But that's more frustrating because their heart's not in the, playing the game, and I'm much more interested in playing a game if people are invested in that game. I also know people who really hate drawing cards outside of turn order, which I found fascinating when I first found out my friend Sean doesn't like this. And uh, everyone, so, you know, everyone draw a card, and we have to draw the cards in turn order, because those are the cards that you're meant to get. It's random, you're getting a card at the top of the deck, but <laughs> I understand, I get it. But retconning stuff breaks all that. It means, oh, I'm not getting the card I'm meant to get, and you're not getting the card. and So that frustrates people, and I do appreciate that. But for me, I'm probably one of the most lenient people on retconning in a game. I just want everyone to be having fun, and it's more fun when you've got all the stuff that you should have. But I do also appreciate that when information has been learnt, that you wouldn't have had the benefit of knowing when you now take the action that you're now retconning, then that's too late. And you snooze, you lose. It's just one of those things that's always gonna be really game dependent and really group dependent. But if you're playing the game with me and you forgot to take three stone six turns ago, I'm gonna let you have those three stone. I mean, unless that retcon's gonna win you the game, then no, no one's gonna let you do that. <laughs> If you could only play mass market games, what games would you play? The definition of mass market games is kind of changing, I think. I think I know what we all mean by mass market games, but now, I mean, Carcassonne's kind of a mass market game. Catan certainly is. But I know what we mean. We mean like those Hungry Hungry Hippos, Monopoly, those type of games. I mean, right now, if you were going to go to a mass market store like Target, you could pick up probably 10 or 15 really good hobby board games. But I've got some answers for mass market games that I like. Monopoly Deal is a card game with the word Monopoly on the front, which I tell you is going to put a few people off. It's a really good card game. 
it's a good card game. I think it's one of those strange outliers, and I do see a lot of people saying this when they say, Monopoly Deal. Turns out, it's a good game. So that's one I definitely would find if you can, and you can pick it up for five bucks normally. Romy Cub is another one I really quite like. That's a mass market game where you're putting sets out. It's basically Romy the card game, the board game. So I was always gonna like it. So Romy Cub, that's a great game. I'd absolutely play a game of Risk. Risk is a fine game, as long as everybody plays aggressively. You know, no one's like hiding in a corner. If everyone's being as aggressive as you should be in Risk, it's a fun game. Quarko, that's, a, that's probably the best answer that I'm gonna give on this list. Quirkle is a phenomenally good game, uh, which I really do like. You could play with a Ouija board, I guess. I wouldn't advise it, and don't bring a Ouija board anywhere near Paula. I would not advise doing that. But also, actually, Paula would say mass market games that she would play is Clue. Paula loves Clue, so I think Clue, or Cluedo as I would call it, Clue is a good one. And to kind of cheat this answer just a little bit, there's so many classic card games that I love. Rummy, Gin, Hearts, Spades, Cheat Itself. So many games that I like with a pack of cards. That will probably... Poker? I do like playing poker, I tell you. Those are the mass market games I would choose to play. But what are the mass market games that you would choose to play? I'd be very interested to know. And the final question I have this month for you is IP... Or no IP? Okay. I'm kind of nervous about answering this question, but I'll give it a go, because everyone's friends here. I don't really love IPs on games, but like everybody in the world, if it's the IP that I really like, I'm also much more interested in playing a game if it's got an IP that I like. That's the point of IPs. That's the beauty of them. You put something onto a game that a lot of people are going to be really interested in anyway, something like Star Wars, and more people are going to be interested in that game because it's a Star Wars themed game. Now I personally do not care about a lot of the major IPs, but I tell you now, I look at every Star Trek game that comes out because I love Star Trek. That's the beauty of IPs. You better believe if a Matrix board game comes out, I'm going to look at it because the Matrix is the best trilogy of movies ever made. I really think that. So uh, comment below what you think about that. <laughs> Games that I own with an IP are Beowulf the movie board game, which is a Reiner Knizia remake of a game called Kingdoms, which is another remake of an old game with a German name. It's a really fantastic game and actually the Beowulf version is better than Kingdoms because it has three different boards. So I really like that. I also own Lord of the Rings The Confrontation, which is kind of like a Stratego kind of game where actually Stratego would be a good mass market game. Now I think about it, but Lord of the Rings Confrontation is a fantastic kind of like trying to God, trying to just dupe your opponent into letting you win the game. It's, it's really, really good. Both of those are Reiner Knizia games, though, which is why I own them rather than the theme that they are. I suppose, actually, though, I mentioned it earlier, Sword and Stronghold is a mouse guard abstract strategy game, which is a series of comic books, right? So I guess that's a third one, but I bought it because it was a really cute and really, really good abstract game. The worry is, of course, is that the IP is going to be carrying the game. And that certainly, I think, used to be the case. There was a kind of negative connotation with games with IPs on them because a lot of them weren't good. A couple of games that really broke that mould, I feel like, were Spartacus and Battlestar Galactica. But now IP games are great. You look at what Funko's doing, what the people at Prospero Hall are doing. So many good games, quality games with IPs on them. I think the tables have turned a little bit. What Ravensburger does with IP games now. So that's quite exciting. For me, when there's an IP that I don't really care about on a game, I'm still interested in the game if people say it's good. Dune Imperium is a good example of that. It's an absolutely fantastic game. I've got not much interest in Dune, but... It's a really good game, despite for me, despite the IP. But there's also games that I have. One example would be Cursed Court, which is an incredible game. Absolutely brilliant and massively underrated game of uh, deduction and betting and that kind of stuff. And I love it so much. But I tell you now, if 
it should be a Game of Thrones game because so many more people would have had the chance to play it. But please let me know all your opinions and all the questions below. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for watching. And until next time, stay safe and take care.